I decided to make this video because I'm starting to get a lot of referrals for sleep surgery. And um, instead of repeating the same thing over and over again to all the patients, I thought that I would make a video and then everyone could watch it and better understand hopefully what the process is for doing sleep surgery. So most people have had a sleep study by the time they get to me. And here's a little example of a sleep study. We'll kind of blow this up. And what this is the thing that you probably either did at home or you went to a sleep center to get. They put a bunch of monitors on you and you uh, tried to sleep. Most of you guys probably feel like you didn't get very much sleep during the sleep study, but they do measure um, how many times do you stop breathing or breathe poorly. And the, the number that we are most interested in is this apnea hypopnea. And the, this number is the total index. So this number right here, 14.5, 14.9 means that every hour, about 15 times, you have either an apnea, which, which is where you stop breathing, or a hypopnea, where you breathe insufficiently. And that is something called the AHI, or the apnea hypopnea index. And anything greater than five is considered to be abnormal and that you have sleep apnea. So what most people get is they get something called CPAP and you guys have probably tried it. And some people do very well with CPAP and many people just cannot sleep well with it. You know, they pull it off at night or um, it, they get claustrophobic. They just can't sleep well with the CPAP and they want something else done. And most people are coming to me recently because they've heard or seen on TV advertisements for this thing called the Inspire device. And they believe that um, they're kind of led to believe by the advertisements that this is the solution to all their problems. And I'll tell you why it may or may not be the solution for you in particular. All right, so the first step, uh, the first thing to know um, about sleep apnea is that basically most sleep apnea is caused by obesity. Obesity is the number one reason that people have sleep apnea. And as obesity levels in our populations rise, the sleep apnea um, levels rise. And if you lose weight and get to a normal weight, most people can cure their sleep apnea. Um, so sleep apnea is a completely reversible and curable disease in many cases with no surgery and without CPAP. It just requires people lose a lot of weight. Of course, that is always easier said than done. I mean, if it was easy to lose weight, everyone would do it and we wouldn't have this multi-billion dollar weight loss industry. But um, the fact remains that, uh, that obesity is the number one cause for sleep apnea. And it is also um, the cause of other things like high cholesterol, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, heart disease, strokes, cancers, high blood pressure, a host of other things. So if you lose weight, then not only does it can it fix sleep apnea, it will help all those other things that are associated with obesity. So the number one thing is to try to get to a normal weight. So I recommend that patients get below a BMI of 30. Um, and a BMI is something called uh, uh, body mass index. And you can look that up and put in your weight and your height and it'll spit out a number. And anything above 30 is considered obese. And anything under 30, um, I think between 28 and 30 is considered overweight. And anything below 28 is considered normal weight. Um, but uh, most people that I see are well over BMI of 30. Now, BMI is not a very, uh, is not a perfect measure because it just measures weight and height. So therefore, if someone is a very muscular person, they're gonna be heavier and they're not obese. They're just um, very muscular. So BMI is not a perfect measure. And I'll kind of look at the patient and this, you know, and kind of adjust that a little bit. If you're a very muscular person and your BMI is maybe 32, 33, I think that's fine. Um, and that will, we'll let it ride a little higher. Okay, so that's step number one. You need to have a BMI of around 30 or less. And 
Some people deposit more fat in their neck area and that makes it harder. And for those people, it's even more important to lose weight. If you're the kind of person that deposits weight more in your belly or midsection and less around your neck, then BMI will not affect you as much. And so maybe I'll, I'll let the BMI creep up to maybe 32, 33, something like that. But generally get to a BMI of around 30 or below, ideally even 28 and below and get to a normal weight range. And then if you retest the sleep apnea, many people will be cured of sleep apnea as well as reducing the risk of all the other things like, like heart, heart attack, stroke, cancer, um, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and um, you know the resultant like kidney problems and, and, uh, and vision problems. So all kinds of things are better if that happens. Okay, now why does obesity do that? Well, it's because um, if you look at this, the airway, you go, you breathe in through your nose or your mouth, you can go in through your mouth, um, and it goes behind the palate. This palate right here is that little dangly thing in the back of, when you look in the back of people's mouths, and it goes back behind the tongue and behind this little flapper called the epiglottis, and then it goes down into your lungs. So it follows this pathway. Now, if when people are obese, um, the tongue gets larger, yeah, it deposits more fat within the tongue. It's kind of marbling of the muscle. Like people like to talk about with good steaks, they have fat marbling. Um, that's what happens in the tongue and in the other muscles in your body. And then there's fat deposits between the muscles and around the, the throat, which makes the throat narrower. And as you make the throat narrower, then um, that causes it to be more likely to obstruct through something called the Bernoulli principle. And I'll kind of explain that later on. And so this was first um, found out back in 2014 when people did a study where they looked at MRIs and looked at obese people and especially people, obese people with sleep apnea and looked at fat deposition. And if you look at this, you can see a lot of fat deposition in the tongue. So you see the tongue here and this tongue is quite large and it pushes the chin down underneath the jaw and it pushes up along the airway and it narrows this airway so that it's harder to breathe. And when people lose weight, so they uh, they did another study where they had people lose weight, either through bariatric surgery or intensive mo lifestyle modification. Now, of course, um, I personally believe as a surgeon that surgery is something to be avoided if at all possible. If you can, you, if you can accomplish the same thing without surgery, then you should do it without surgery because surgery has risks and you want to avoid those risks if you can. And uh, eating healthy and exercising, which as a way of losing weight, only has good side effects. A healthy diet and exercise only has good side effects. Surgery has bad side effects. So if you can do it without surgery, so without bariatric surgery, that's the better way to do it. Anyway, these people, either through bariatric surgery, this is, you know, people call it like stomach stapling or gastric bypass surgery is the way that you may have heard of it. But um, in the, in the uh, medical literature, we call it bariatric surgery. Uh, intensive lifestyle modification is, you know, basically healthy diet and exercise. And when they did that, they noticed that their tongue volumes went way down. And so, and their sleep apnea got significantly better. So that's what, um, that's what caused, that is the major cause of sleep apnea. Um, and so in a normal airway, this stays open. And then when it gets a little narrower, people get snoring. And what happens at night is everything just kind of relaxes. All your muscle tone relaxes as you sleep and gravity pulls all this back. And then it makes this narrow. And if, when it's really narrow and it's really pushed back, then you get obstruction. So going back to the sleep study, this tells you how many times per hour you obstruct. But we need to figure out where do you obstruct? So the sleep uh, study just tells you how many times you obstruct. It doesn't tell you where. Then we have to do something called drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And that's where we bring you to the operating room, give you medicine to put you to sleep. And then, uh, and not fully asleep like surgery, but we're trying to mimic the sleep that you have at home. And we put a camera down through your nose and look down this way and try to see, are you obstructing here at the palate? Are you obstructing at the tongue? Are you obstructing at the epiglottis? Where is the obstruction? Because um, depending on where the obstruction is, there may be different surgeries or different interventions that are good for you. And so I'm going to look, I'm going to show you a couple of videos of sleep endoscopies 
that other surgeons did um, that they posted on YouTube and we'll look at them. So this is, we're looking down, going back to this picture, the camera is right here and we're looking down from about here. So we're looking down here and you'll see that it gets very narrow and it opens up and it closes. Now, why does it open up and close? And that's because of this thing called the Bernoulli principle is whenever you blow air through a narrow area, it causes a decrease in pressure um, in that area and it causes a vacuum and it sucks everything in. So you'll see here as they blow air through here, watch what happens to this bottle. So they're blowing air from here through here and it gets to this narrow area and it's the the pressure the vacuum is so great that it's crushing this uh this um bottle and so you can imagine like if this was not stiff it would just collapse that tube and that's exactly what's happening in people it collapses the tube every time they try to breathe and so it's open now it's closed now okay we're going to stop here this little thing right here is this epiglottis so we're looking at the epiglottis and then those white things is the vocal cords uh, sorry. So these white things you see right here are the vocal cords. Right there. And you see that the tongue moves back and it gets narrow, but you also see this collapse coming in from the side. So see, it's very open here. And then the patient tries to take a breath. And so I would say in this patient, the tongue is not that big of a problem. The tongue is not that big of a problem. And the, the, um, so this is not collapsing back too far. This is what's causing the collapse. Okay, let's look at another example here. So in this example, you see the, you see a lot of collapse coming in from the sides. And this may be the tonsils. And some people, if the tonsils are very big, taking them out can be very helpful. But you see here, so this is um, the kind of the opposite orientation of the previous video. Here you see the epiglottis right there. And you see that the tongue base does not push back that far and this air airway stays open but you get collapse from above and let's take a look at another one okay in this one you see that the tongue base is pushing the epiglottis back and it gets very narrow and so in this person the tongue is a major problem you don't see this collapse coming in from the sides and you see that the tongue is making it very narrow and you see that you see a little bit collapsing in from the sides, but it's not as bad as the previous video. Anyway, there's many configurations of this and we just need to figure out which of these things caused the problem. Now, if this is the problem, there's a different surgery for that. If the tongue base is the problem, then Inspire Therapy is good for that. If it's the epiglottis, we can do things to stiffen this epiglottis and attach it closer to the tongue so it doesn't flop backwards and block the airway. So there's many options. Now, if someone has collapsed from the sides, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for that. So collapse from the sides or, or concentric collapse, both of those, there isn't much we can do surgically to help those people. And that is usually the pattern you see in obese people, which is why we ask people to lose weight before we do any surgery. Now, uh, we'll get to the thing that people are interested in. So first, step number one to reiterate, lose weight. Uh, get to a normal weight. Step number two, we do this drug-induced sleep endoscopy. That is a very simple two-minute procedure. Um, there's no cuts. There's no recovery from that. Um, you do need a driver to bring you to the uh, hospital so you can drive home because we give you drugs to make you sleepy. And that, that drug-induced sleep endoscopy does not treat anything. It just gives us information about where the blockage is and what the pattern of blockage is. Now, uh, this is a, a presentation I gave for the company a while back. So I'm going to kind of skip through the, the, um, the boring parts and get to uh, parts that maybe are useful. Okay, so, all right, so this is, this is how it works. Um, there is a, we, we implant an electrode all around the hypoglossal nerve, which is the nerve that controls your tongue. And then we put another sensor lead in between the muscles of your ribs. And then the device is implanted like a pacemaker in your chest, under your, your pectoralis muscle, under the chest muscle. And what this does is every time you try to take a breath at night, this thing, this sense lead senses it and then it sends it to the processor, the generator, and the generator generates a pulse uh, to stimulate the, um, 
the tongue. So it's essentially a pacemaker for the tongue that's timed to your breathing. And we find this hypoglossal nerve and there's certain branches that make the tongue pull back, which you don't want to do that. And you find the, the, uh, the branches that make the tongue for, pull forward. Those are the ones you want. So we would put, you wouldn't want to put the cuff right here. You'd want to put the electrode right here. So it stimulates all these muscles and not these muscles. And then there's like a little remote control they give you to fix that. Um, all right, so this is a picture showing, um, you see how the tongue collapses here. And again, you see every time they take a breath, it collapses. And then this is the palate. You see that collapse. It's, it's like completely collapsed. And then you see here, when, when the thing is on, it does collapse, but not completely. And you see that open. Okay. Uh, what other things? Okay, so you know, generally people get good results. They want um, people to have a BMI of 30 to 35, and they're trying to make the BMI higher. They, they want to implant more and more people. Of, of course, the company wants to implant more people. They're in the business of making money, and they want to implant as many people as possible. I want to avoid surgery in patients as much as possible. So if they can get better by losing weight, and being healthier and avoid surgery, that is the best outcome for them. Um, so my my metric is somewhat lower than that. I would like people to get under 30 if possible. Um, so it, it is well tolerated. The the patients that I pick, especially since I have, uh, I have criteria that's even more stringent than the company has, they do very, very well and it treats their sleep apnea very well and they, they um, Okay, uh, they do very well. Now this, this doesn't tell you about the, okay, they tell you a little bit about the complications that they have and they make it look very good. But in any surgery, there are possible complications. And what they don't mention is some people feel like there is, um, they can feel the activation. It's, it's a little uncomfortable for them. Some people have pain from that. And um, it's very, very rare, but it's not zero. And so there are possible complications with the procedure and um, the, the, out, the number of people that have those complications is very, very low. But if it's something you can treat without surgery, then you should try to treat it without surgery. Okay, so that is the steps for doing the, um, doing the implant. So um, first, normal achieve a normal weight, ideally through healthy diet and exercise. Step number two, get a drug-induced sleep endoscopy so we can identify where the collapse happens. And step number four, if you're a candidate for surgery, you will get one of three surgeries. Surgery One surgery is palatoplasty, where we um, try to move this palate forward and um, expand the nasopharynx to give you more airway there. Step an the, Another surgery is the Inspire implant that we briefly talked about, which is a pacemaker for your tongue. And then the last surgery that um, I offer is epiglottopexy, which is where we stiffen the epiglottis and attach it, um, scar it a little bit to the back of the tongue so it doesn't, it doesn't flop into the airway and block the airway. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them.